So welcome to Designing for the Playful Classroom. This is your GLS game show experience this afternoon. So without further ado, I want to welcome our contestants. All right. First up, we have from Rochester, New York, and Teachly. Kara Carpenter. <laughs> Fun fact about Kara, she has eaten many kinds of insects. <laughs> Next up, I wish, oh wait, hold on. I wish to welcome Charlotte Duncan of Curriculum Associates. <laughs> Coming from Boston originally, she was born with a crossed eye. <laughs> Next contestant is Christina Oliver. Hailing from <laughs> Buffalo, she just binged watch both seasons of Stranger Things in a week. <laughs> and finally, last but not least, we have Allison Levy of BrainPod. <laughs> from Albany, New York, she is a former teacher who likes stripy socks. <laughs> Yay, let's say welcome to our contestants. <laughs> welcome everybody. Uh, as you can tell, we're going to try to do a truly playful session about uh, learning in the classroom today. We are playing Games for Change Feud. So uh, first, I'd just like to get a little bit of a sense of who's here. Um, how many folks here are game developers or designers? Lots of folks. Any teachers? <laughs> Yay! Um, any, uh, who else are we looking for? Students? Nice. Librarians. What else we got? Who am I missing? Researchers? Excellent. Welcome to all of you. I want you to do one thing first. I want you to look at our lovely panelists here. Christina, Kara, Allison, Charlotte, and decide who you want to win the game. <laughs> and tell your neighbor, but don't tell us. Go ahead, tell your neighbor. <laughs> I want all of you to win equally, and we're not really keeping score, so this is an arbitrary question. Okay, so here's how this game is gonna work. We came up with a bunch of questions around playful learning experiences in the classroom, and we sent them out to teachers for a survey. So our survey says, I was very happy that I found this image <laughs> from the original Family Feud, but this is not one of our questions. So what we're going to do is you guys are going to pick the topics we're going to cover, and then we are going to read off questions related to those topics. Our panelists have some pieces of paper with letters on them. They're going to reveal their answer after 15 seconds, and then I will reveal what the survey said. Um, let the games begin. Let's get into it. These are the themes that we explored in our survey. So we have design. I mean, how do you design these products? Working with teachers and students, professional development, technology, adoption and implementation, and as assessment and impact. So over to the audience, what topic, this is like the Jeopardy category you get to call out. What do you want to talk about first? Assessment. Assessment, assessment. all right. All right, except for you making, me, you're making me go all the way to the end of my slides, but I'm going to forgive you. All right. Assessment and impact. Don't cheat. Okay. 15 seconds. <laughs> what phrase best represents how you think about games and assessment? A, what do you mean assessment? Games are just for fun. B, games should be accompanied by a more traditional form of assessment, like a multiple choice quiz. C, gameplay is a form of, of assessment in and of itself. D, Games should always be accompanied by an essay. <laughs> e, other. You guys don't need 15 seconds by the time I finish reading the question. No, okay. All right. One, two, three, reveal. Yay. A lot of C's. I can't see Allison and Charlotte's answer, so. Everyone had a C. Well, let's see if you were right. I gotta get my first. Survey says. C! Good job, everybody. Ding, 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 ding. Gameplay is a form of assessment in and of itself. That was 87.5%. Only two people answered games should be accompanied by a quiz, which is hilarious. Um, I would like one of our panelists to just talk a little bit about this topic. 
So I'm going to go to Kara first. Um, so at Teachly, we do um, math games for elementary schools, um, but we sort of describe it as formative assessment data for teachers coming from kids' authentic gameplay. Um, and so many of the respondents on this survey are like folks who use <laughs> um, our games, and so they're, they're not necessarily the average teacher out there, but um, I think that, the, that our teachers at least, like once they sort of get the experience of, hey, my kids can be playing a game and I can be getting information in real time about this is the kid who needs help and this is exactly what they need help with, um, it can be a really powerful um, motivator for sort of continuing the gameplay. We did some research this spring where we assigned grade level teams to either just the games or games plus the data. We actually found that teachers in the games plus the data group continued to play 70% more than the teachers in the other group after the coaching ended. And so there really is some value to that data. And interestingly, that was true for teachers who looked at their data on a regular basis, and it was also true for teachers who did not even look at the data, just the fact that it was out there. Um, and maybe someday I would look at it, or maybe an administrator might be looking at it. There was definitely this more interest in the games. I'll add a little something. Um, I think a big part of our roles uh, in designing these experiences is helping educators think about um, the big picture of assessment if they are going to use uh, games in the classroom. And I think it's important to keep in mind that it's not just the actual gameplay itself, the students engaged with, in this case, digital games, but also what's happening around the games. So a practical thing that you can consider, since there are many game developers and teachers in the room, are things like pause points in the games, teachable moments where you might facilitate by asking a question or pausing the game and inviting kids to share a uh, strategy that they figured out or reflecting and debriefing after the game, um, you know, asking students what's one moment in the game that you got stuck and what would you do about that or how did you overcome that moment? So looking at the big picture, not just the actual in the game time, but what's happening surrounding the game. All right, moving on to our next question. The following are valid demonst demonstrates. Somebody messed up their slides. <laughs> the following are valid demonstrations of a game's impact on students. A, noise level in the classroom. B, discussions that happen during and outside of gameplay. C, dashboard or other student level performance data. D, creation of a product or culminating event. E, brief written reflection. And as I give these folks a couple of moments to think about that, a lot of these questions we asked sort of check all that apply. So we had most popular answers, but there are multiples, and I'll point that out where that happens. <laughs> Allison's hacking the game already. We just started. All right. What do we got? B. 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 F. I couldn't pick one. Yeah. Well, and yeah, who wrote these questions? Uh, it was a uh, it was a close one. Um, a lot of Bs, a lot of Cs, but definitely more than, so we had a, a 19 teacher survey. Um, sev at least seven teachers answered each one of these. Um, so well done, panel. So far, so good. <laughs> uh, so who would like to talk about that? Um, I'll talk about that briefly. Um, something that I find really interesting about B discussions, um, something you can't get from something like, well, you can get it from an essay a little bit, uh, something you can't get from a dashboard is that sort of emotional reaction that students are having. Are they talking really excitedly? Do they want to talk to multiple people about their experience? Uh, can you see any sort of stress in their response? Um, those sort of affective things that uh, you can't really get from that hard data, um, you can get from those conversations, um, which is super fascinating. I just add one thing to this. I think one of the things that we try to do um, at Classroom Inc. is, as Allison said earlier, right? you have a game experience, and then you have this facilitated experience, whether you're building background knowledge or reflecting, 
And I think one of our goals is to really provide um, the tools, the, the rich questioning, so that educators don't have to kind of come up with that on the fly, right? So really designing for those higher level thinking and higher level, um, higher order thinking skills within within the content, outside of, outside and obviously inside, but outside of the game experience to really set us up. Excellent. We have one more assessment question, then we'll pick a new topic. Would you use gameplay data, or for instance, provided by a game dashboard as part of a student's grade? Yes, no, depends on the data, um, or other. And we had some interesting other responses on this one. And how we doing? Allison's still looking. We good? And see. C, 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 C. D. <laughs> D, so other, please specify. <laughs> um, so I would say it definitely depends on the data, but also depends on the game. Um, if it's not a game that I think is uh, effectively teaching a certain concept or doesn't approach it the way that I would have liked to, um, then the data isn't necessarily gonna be as useful for me. Um, so being really uh, critical about the whole experience and how that fits into the context of your classroom and your students, um, that all really matters. I'm gonna jump in on this one, even though it's kind of a rogue thing to do as the host. <laughs> um, but I'm a game designer and writer and producer, and one of the things that um, I've experienced is like a, a horror experience of finding that teachers were transferring scores from games that I created into their kids, um, their kids' grades um, when they were not built for that. You know, a lot of times we build games that have a lot of scaffolding integrated or where there's an expectation of struggle and then that's part of the, um, the experience that you really want students to be having. And so uh, I think my experience in this, I, I would say as, as a game developer and designer is be really intentional about how you're providing that data to teachers because they wanna see a percentage a lot of the time, but the percentage may not be tuned uh, the same way that other percentages are in the classroom. So, Yeah, just to add to that, how you design that, the way that you're showing that data is super important um, to make sure that people understand what it actually is supposed to mean and how they can use it, um, make sure it's used responsibly, <laughs> which is very difficult. All right, so it's back to you, audience. We have knocked assessment and impact on our list. What's up next? Design. design. We'll do design and then professional development. All right, design. It's a light question to start us off. <laughs> what is the most important consideration when designing digital games for the classroom as relates to students? Uh, the age developmental stage of the students, degree of background knowledge, environment, whether it's gonna be done in the classroom, home, informal programs, et cetera, experience with digital games, or all of the above. TikTok, Christine, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, one, two, three. Survey says <laughs> A and C. I like you cheated all of the above. <laughs> Allison is really a if cheater. If I knew you were going rogue, I would have created a whole <laughs> other thing. Allison really does not like to play by the provided rules. We'll remember that in our scoring at the end. Um, so wait, you had A and C? I had A and C. Well, interestingly, A, was actually the most responded, uh, that, was, that was the majority, 47% of respondees said that. Uh, which I, I thought was interesting because all of the above was not. Um, well, in the, not that you nope. are allowing me to speak, <laughs> but yeah. it says no. the most important, right? So if we're looking at an assessment, you're looking at most yep. important. I was just reading closely over here. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll, I will qualify. Allison, <laughs> I will qualify my my answer. Uh, we develop literacy learning games, so we're really focused on reading comprehension. And obviously, I bring my own you know bias to the panel. So obviously, age, development, literacy, those things are reading level. Those are all incredibly, incredibly important pieces when thinking about game design. And that that you know balance of an appropriately kind of challenging or frustrating experience for for kids. All I right. thought it said what are the two most <laughs> important. Right, a likely story. <laughs> Moving on. Question two. 
Well-designed digital learning games exemplify which values? How do you like that sentence structure? A, fun. B, shooting something random. <laughs> C, integrating the game mechanics with learning content. D, A, and C. Can you tell Allison wrote this question? <laughs> Just for the record, that was you, wasn't it? All right. Get ready, and go. D, C, D, D. D, A and C. Survey says 68.42%. It's funny the numbers you get when you have 19 respondents. <laughs> um, so who wants to talk about this? I'm going back to Kara. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I thought that teachers were going to be paying more attention to the sort of the integrating of the game mechanics because I feel like that's the piece that's much more difficult to accomplish and so it's the one that like we place a lot of value on because I think the the fun part um, comes from the challenge and comes from you know a lot of the other you know it's definitely the fun is important but I feel like the fun is not the thing that makes it hard um, what makes designing a digital game really difficult is choosing something that's very difficult to teach, very difficult to learn, and sort of really designing a learning mechanic that encourages students to develop an understanding of that. Um, and it's, yeah, not easy. Yeah, Absolutely. I'll just add to that. Um, so BrainPop has Game Up, so it's a collection of digital games that tie across the curriculum um, by many organizations that we partner with, such as Classroom Inc. <laughs> and <laughs> Teachly. Um, and many others, and you know, I always say for every hundred games we look at, because we literally look at hundred games, uh, hundreds of games, finding um, that marriage between the learning content and a meaningful mechanic that uh, helps to drive in that project, that uh, learning content is probably like, you know, I, I say there's like one in every hundred, so it's like looking for those gems that really do it well, and I think it's so, so hard to do. Um, but these, these <laughs> partners do it very, very well, so you, you've got I just good resources. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, hopefully when you get to C, A will follow. Yeah. Um, that's something that we found uh, at Curriculum Associates doing some great research on engagement in our lessons, uh, that when students are appropriately challenged, they are having fun. Um, even if uh, we create a prototype that is super, super just low design, just there's not much happening, um, if the content is appropriately challenging for them, they will be engaged. Um, and actually, if they fail, we'll go back and try again 15 times. Um, so just that, that game mechanic and that ability to be challenged um, can actually be fun in and of itself. All right, next question. I like this one. What is the ideal length? of a game experience to ensure utility in the classroom? A, less than five minutes, B, five to 10 minutes, C, 10 to 30 minutes, D, 30 minutes or more. All right, show your answers. C, 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 that's correct, survey says, ding. <laughs> Um, yep, almost 60%, 11 of our 19 answered 10 to 30 minutes. So I thought this was really interesting. I would love to hear you guys talk about this. I did too. I actually thought this, oh, you have a question. Oh, yeah. So as, as Kara said, we're surveying teachers that are in our network, so, but that's a very broad range. I mean, I... We're going from elementary up through at least middle school. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so it's it's definitely a, a probably more game savvy part of the teacher community. Um, but we do have a pretty wide range of ages that we're, we're talking to folks about. We have lessons for kindergarten as well. Yes. <laughs> so bring it down. <laughs> um, so I was just going to say that, you know, it, it's no great information, right? 45 minutes, right? You have 40 to 45 minutes within within a, a classroom um, uh, class period. And so that 10, it's so funny because I actually thought most folks were going to say B. That was where I was kind of falling on at. Um, but we designed games that are about 25 minutes, so I had to stay true to the... Uh, <laughs> stay on brand. Right. Stay on brand. <laughs> exactly. Um, but the, the beauty, I think, of any great game design experience is that actually you can hop in and out, uh, that you don't have to be committed to 30 full minutes, right? That may not work for 
a wide variety of our learners. Um, and so from a game design standpoint, you shouldn't have to do 30 minutes and then, you know, for, for that game experience. And uh, I, do, I will say that is something that we, we've designed for that you can kind of pop in and out, though the experience is really 25, around 25 minutes is like the sweet spot for. It also feels very dependent on the content, right? Of course. And, and the age group. Of course. Yeah. And I think, uh, you oh. know, in reality, um, a 45 minute class period is right. really like 28 right. minutes yeah. of like quality time once they come in and get settled and you do a little intro thing and this is what we're gonna do and then the setup. <laughs> so. I like that there was like a broader range in there. So it could be 12 minutes of actually playing the game and then you wanna leave eight minutes the e at the end for debriefing and then they have to get their backpacks on and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the, to consider the elementary school classroom, I would say that I, I mean, did ch choose C because I think any one time that kids are playing, it's often in a center rotation or it's like I do a mini lesson and then I go off and play. But um, I would say that our teachers are looking for an experience that kids go back to often. So it would be a 15 to 30 minute experience, but that they could have hours and hours of gameplay within a particular game um, is, is definitely um, what our users are looking for. Yeah, and I think that's true for everybody here, everybody up here, I mean. Yeah. Maybe not all of you, but everyone up here who makes product that's your model. Last design question, and then we'll move on to professional development. Or we'll take another vote and see if we, that wins. Uh, what is the most important consideration when designing digital games for the classroom as relates to teachers? So our first question was about students, and this one's about teachers. Uh, a, curricular fit. B, time required. C, comfort with technology. D, reporting mechanisms, like dashboards. E, all of the above. Again, Say the most thing. important in all of the above <laughs> gives us a little wiggle room, doesn't it? <laughs> We're not survey writers, just for the record. Right. No researcher was no, used not in a writing researcher on this questions. panel. Has to well, 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 you do some research, but you uh, let, I just you let us expert. you let us <laughs> bully you into all of the above. Okay, you uh, <laughs> survey sit. A curricular fit, curricular oh, fit. B. And you're all wrong. Um, all of the above won by a landslide. Uh, but that's a little bit of a cheat. Uh, curricular fit was the second most uh, popular response. OK, here we go. That's you, uh, Christina. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think with the educators that we're working with, and again, we, are, are deve we develop really for fifth through around ninth graders. Uh, Obviously, we're talking about a middle school classroom. These are ELA teachers. They very, very jam-packed um, curriculum um, uh, mandates that are often on their shoulders. And so curricular fit is by far, from a kind of, from our, our user's standpoint, by far one of the most important components is that how, what, what problem are you solving for me? And where exactly does this fit? Is this a is this a unit? Can I replace a novel study with you know this particular learning game, or can I replace something else? Is this my you know um, daily intervention, etc.? So really picking a very very specific quote problem or curricular area is obviously it, from our standpoint has been completely essential to to the design. All right, I think we're going to move into professional development <laughs> because we're we're time is getting close. What? Yeah, of course. can talk about a little. Uh, I, I love that point. So I think with something that's a little bit more open-ended and sandboxy like Minecraft, you want to provide at least some examples. Here's what it looks like in a social studies classroom with middle schoolers. Here's what it looks like doing a lesson on digital citizenship with second graders and building community. Um, so you want to provide some vision. Sometimes, like when I was teaching, I remember searching for games about multiplication, so I would Google fourth grade plus multiplication plus interactive plus game and you get a zillion results, so I knew I was looking for something to fit into the unit that I was studying on multiplication. So I think it definitely depends, but if you have something that could have multiple applic applications or is kind of a bigger picture context, 
you want to paint a picture for, for teachers and paint that picture in multiple ways. So some teachers want the like, I, I keep hearing about Minecraft, but I don't know where to, where to get started. So you want to provide a little more scaffolding with that. Some teachers just need to see like a 30 second video or read a little bit of a um, uh, tip or, or example of how one teacher is using it. And then they're like, okay, I got it. I know exactly how I'm going to tailor it to, to work in my, my context. Okay, great. So that was a good segue, actually. Professional development. Uh, where do teachers need the most support in integrating playful learning technology? A, finding resources. B, alignment to skills or standards. C, planning implementation. D, guiding students in play. Or E, reflecting on the experience, assessing learning. This was also a check all that apply. <laughs> we, we, we did a check all apply on this one. All right, so you may all be right. You can, no, no. <laughs> Stop doing that. Um, just answer. You can pick one at random. One, two, three, go. Very random. A, C, A. I don't know what Allison has. A, oh, I want A. So um, B, actually, alignment to skills or standards, which sort of just follows up on our last question. Uh, was 14 of the 19 teachers identified that. But this was fairly evenly distributed. 11 teachers said planning implementation, 11 said guiding students in play, 13 said reflecting on the experience. Um, only four said finding resources, which I thought was interesting. Um, but it does sort of speak to what we're just discussing. So. Yeah, we provide B, C, D, and E for <laughs> our teachers. <laughs> right. Um, and sometimes the hardest part is digging through all of this um, and finding exactly the thing that you need at that moment. Um, and that sort of goes back to the time piece, too. Um, that's a, an area where we're really trying to cut down the time for teachers, um, where we have so much stuff for them um, as support materials. But how do we get them to the one piece that they need at that moment in a really timely manner? All right. Keep pressing the keyboard on the wrong computer. Okay. What types of support materials or resources do teachers want most? A, game guides. B, videos. C, professional development. D, technical support. E, other. Please specify. Ready? Reveal. <laughs> Everyone had to show me too. C, 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 C's and B's, C's and B's. D, technical support. Yeah. <laughs> so I, that was sort of sad. <laughs> but I think true, you know, as I feel like all of us have been through this and been the person in the classroom like kicking the, you know. <laughs> The wireless router trying to make your thing work, or the computer that was, you know, you're not allowed to download any software on. Christina <laughs> and I ran into that once. When you only have a downloadable program, it's a problem. Um, but I thought that was very interesting. And um, professional development was, was the second most responded to. All right, I'm going to do one more professional development question and talk a little bit about that. And then maybe we should just turn it open to discussion. So. Last PD question. What kinds of professional development opportunities do you find most useful in terms of implementing games in the classroom? A, videos of other teachers or classrooms using the game. B, webinars. C, in-person demos. D, written resources, so like descriptions or walkthrough documents. E, other. All right, last one, big reveal. A, 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 C. C, Charlotte wins. <laughs> you won the whole thing because you got the last question right. Um, no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Everyone's a winner. Uh, yeah, whoever was rooting for Charlotte, good job. Uh, so in-person demos was was the uh, was the winner here, and I think we have several organizations that actually do that here. So it might be interesting for you all to talk about that for a sec. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I'll be using this for the rest of the day. Um, uh, so we do a lot of uh, in-person professional development um, and lots of demos and having teachers use our stuff themselves and really get into the mindset of the students. Um, and we've also done a lot of research on that professional development 
and found that the more professional development that our teachers have gotten on our resources and our lessons, the happier they are with our product. Um, so that's why I picked <laughs> And I'll just add from the from the standpoint of A, so we, we as well do a ton of, um, we have really deep partnerships with, uh, with schools and community-based organizations, do a ton of in-person training and provide ongoing instructional coaching as folks are utilizing um, our learning games. Um, I think my reaction, of course, such bias, which I will share with you all, which is that, you know, when we think about kind of reaching as many educators and students as possible, I won't have a team of, we're, a, we're an organization of you know 15, so I don't have 50 coaches that I can spread across New York, for that matter, or the nation, or the world. And so I'm, we're, all, we're always trying to think of, first and foremost, the most simple, intuitive experience, right? Just a user experience so that you don't need tons and tons of guidance. Um, but having said that, there is, there is no replacement for a level of in-person professional development and really understanding what folks need and giving them, particularly teachers who have no time, right, and really giving them the support that they need in order to, to kind of learn um, and incorporate any tool, you know, into their practice. Um, so huge, huge proponent, utter passion, former teacher, never got enough PD, uh, good PD. <laughs> Very important, <laughs> but also trying to think, balance that among, you know, a, a broader scale. Yeah. Great. So in the last 12 minutes and 24 <laughs> seconds we have left, oh. I have a very precise timing system over here. Um, I, we can continue to play, but I think we should uh, turn it over to questions, see if there's some questions, and if there aren't, we'll go back to another topic. Uh, so a big part of, of what we do at BrainPop, whether it's games that we're developing ourselves or games that we're considering or partners of ours through GameUp, um, is involving kids and teachers from the very beginning. And so um, we'll, we've you know developed relationships with teachers over the years, and in a sense, I feel like I collect teachers. So I know if we're developing a new math game that's geared towards third graders, like these are the the teachers that I'm gonna, you know, talk to first and see if they're interested in in play testing and collaborating. Um, and the way I approach them is saying this is an opportunity to help shape the direction of this game, or tool or feature, um, because we want to make sure it works for you and we don't want to make any assumptions. Um, even if we have experienced teachers, we're not. You know, I've been out of the classroom for over ten years, so. We need to be working closely with teachers, and it's important to do that throughout the process from the very beginning and in a diverse um, range of contexts. So even though the game might be designed for third grade um, third graders and it's on a particular math topic, we also want to see what does that look like in a fifth grade classroom and in a first grade classroom, and we want to see what does it look like when a school only has one, per, one computer per classroom versus tablets only, and all of this to say, um, every time we go and play test, which for us, um, and, and I know for all of, all of uh, the women up here, is very frequent, um, the, the lesson that I feel like I learn over and over is how important it is to design flexibly, because you really can't assume that your game is going to, uh, or that uh, the, the people using your game are always going to have a class set of tablets, or that it's going to work on Chrome, even though it you know, works perfectly on Mac, because that's what you've been testing it. And so testing in a range of scenarios, and a range of devices, with a range of learning styles, with a range of teachers, both teachers who are experienced in game-based learning and very tentative about game-based learning, uh, helps shape the whole process. Hopefully, and to help. what Alison just said, we did have a question that we didn't get to about what is it safe to assume that will be in a classroom, technology-wise. Yeah, you know, Chromebooks, desktops, yeah, and assume nothing won by a landslide. <laughs> so <laughs> that speaks to what you were just discussing. Yeah, I'll say the framing of um, you know you're you're seeing this for the first time. Not many people have ever seen this before. You're making this better for other people. That totally works with students too. Um, students can get really excited by that notion of, you know, being part of that design process. Um, so that's a, something that we often say to students when we're playtesting is, 
you know, you're helping us make this better for other kids like you. Um, so be brutal. Um, and often kids will be a lot more brutal than adults, which is great. <laughs> we always learn something that we didn't expect. Yeah, I would also suggest um, really thinking about sort of equity and thinking about um, designing games that work for struggling learners. Um, that's definitely been our focus. We, spe you know, we, we have a longstanding um, sort of playtesting relationship with an after-school program, and we um, specifically try to work with the, the kids who are really struggling um, because from our perspective, it just gives us a lot more insight into you know, what supports students need. Um, and yeah, and so it's fine to sort of play with um, typical kids too, but to really try to, I mean, if you're interested in, in, in equity, really trying to work with the struggling learner. And also like a big consideration um, that's getting a lot more attention now is accessibility and how to design an accessible game. So what happens if your game is, in, is put in front of a blind student or and there's no, you know, supports for that in the game. So different kinds of um, equity and support, and there's uh, it's a whole um, conversation that's getting a lot of attention now, and very important to to follow and keep up with. That's great. Really helpful. Pay attention to the research, like is where I would say to sort of go yeah. to as well. Right. Like a lot of issues with dyslexia is actually sort of uh, phonological awareness. Um, and so it's not surprising that the dyslexic font doesn't actually work. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's a lot that's actually kind of that developing sort of auditory sense, um, but but looking to see like f from the research literature what works um, it is can be really important too. And so like bridge all of the things that you bring as a game designer, but then really bring in some of the like what we know about cognition and learning into it, which okay. is true across the board, yeah. right? It, no right. Whatever you're designing for, there's research about it. Have you discovered any? Um, games or digital experience that your son is, is like, this is a dream, if only there were more than this. Like, have you found an example that people could? Not really. Okay. I mean, he loves Minecraft and things like that. But anything with words is very frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, actually, there was something he was playing the other day where he had to read it. And um, I was holding it on the uh, iPad and I was moving it. And he goes, stop moving it. Even when it's still, it feels like it's moving. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, God. Yeah. Um, when
cases that, yeah, like you said, look at the research because I know it's clinical. I'm also a nurse practitioner and I look at some of that research, but it's not being done. And there's such a large percentage of the population that's dyslexic and struggles. And especially in these, these um, virtually assisted camps and schools like that. And I don't know what happens with them. I can't imagine if they could work how those kids must struggle in these classrooms. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, totally. Um, so we do uh, a bunch of research on the efficacy of our product. So that's a big headline: is it works, and we will be able to give you this kinds of gain, these kinds of gains in these students. Um, so hitting up front with that sort of proof <laughs> is definitely a, a big way to to get people in. Um, I think uh, having one thing that we do is uh, an adaptive assessment. Um, and so the assessment places students in the lessons that they need based on how they did on the assessment. Um, so having that adaptivity is also really powerful. Um, a big sort of compliment <laughs> that we get is that, you know, this has really helped me differentiate in a way that I don't have time for during the day. Um, so the, the fact that the program itself is flexible in a way that teachers don't have to make it flexible um, or figure out who goes where. Um, that's something that, that has been really powerful as well. Um, did, that, did I answer your question as well? <laughs> and I just wanted to weigh in because we had a question about what was what's the most effective strategy for convincing teachers to use games for learning. Mm -hmm. We got the most other responses of this than anything and they were all basically, this first one um, I feel like sums up a lot of what you just said which is, Teachers need to be able to justify spending an entire teaching session behind a screen. Some school systems frown upon too much time spent on just one activity. The most effective strategy needed for convincing teachers is a clear connection to state standards, but the teachers are not the group that needs to be convinced. It's the <laughs> administrators. Um, and many people said, it's hard to implement new approaches with no support from the top, especially if money is concerned, right? Like we're not, it, teachers alone are, uh, teachers want help too. <laughs> right, yeah. That, that top down and bottom up, if you can get both ways, you're, you're pretty golden, <laughs> um, but that's, that's super difficult. <laughs> and one, one other thing, just to add to that, kind of on the other end of the spectrum, is we always offer if the kids and the, the teacher want to do a Q&A, so we try to bring different members of the team and talk about their professions and what their um, jobs entail and the collaboration that's involved and have a little time at the end for them to you know, not only is it cool that you get to, to meet the people behind a product that you enjoy using, but you get also get to ask them, like, what is your job like, and what do you have to have at your res on your resume to work at Bring Pop? And, you know, uh, that was one of my favorite questions that a student ever asked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but making, you know, m helping them to see, like, if you're really interested in writing or coding or drawing or researching, like, this could be part of your future. All right, we're out of time, unfortunately. So thank you all so much. Thanks to our lovely contestants. <laughs>